the big idea of our HBR article and the big idea of the book is that experiences are a distinct economic offering. That they're as distinct from services as services are from goods. And that increasingly, those experiences will be bought and sold. That they will comprise economic output. They won't just be going to Disneyland, won't just be going to the movie cinema, but even in financial services industry, indeed even in banking, we will see emerge from services these experiences. That's the big idea in the book. What I hope to do this morning is give, start off with a number of different examples and then provide a couple of frameworks and some design principles that hopefully you can carry forward as you pursue this notion of the, of the I would say, the guest experience, not just the customer experience, if we can borrow from Disney. Before we get to those examples, I'd like to share a few pioneers of this emerging experience economy. The first is a gentleman to whom you can all learn something. And who is this? Taxi driver, and what particular taxi driver? Jim, Jim Ignatowski, or Iggy, as his friends called him on the popular TV show Taxi. And Iggy was the world's worst taxi cab driver. You know, so what's there to learn from him? <clears throat> well, except for this one episode, where he actually decided to embrace the principles of dynamic perfectionism, which sounds, if you, as you heard him talk about it, sounded remarkably like mass customization. And in this one episode, he set record levels of fares and tips. And let's think about how he did this. Think about the traditional service metrics for a taxi cab. Availability, speed, accuracy, you know, service metrics that translate to a number of different industries. In some cities of the United States, perhaps speaking English would be something we would be looking for. He actually did not improve any of these. What he did instead is he offered his guests cheese and crackers, beverages. He jury-rigged this intercom system, and he sang Sinatra tunes as they went through the streets of New York City. And when he wasn't having a 60s flashback, he could actually muster quite an engaging conversation and give just captivating tours of the city. And for this one week, he was the envy of the garage. And the way he did this, the way he gathered these increased revenues, was not on the basis of competing on the level of services, but rather staging a unique taxi cab experience. Now, Iggy is just a fictional character, so let's look at a real-world example. Remember these characters? Who's this? Millie Vanilli. And what are they famous for? Lip singing. <laughs> Millie Vanilli won the 1980 Grammy Award for their hit song, Girl You Know It's True, which of course later on we found out was not true. <laughs> but think about Millie Vanilli in terms of their economic offering. Think about what economists would classify as their physical goods in terms of the, the records. Remember those? Re records and cassettes, their physical goods. Think of what economists would classify as services in the form of their concerts. What happened to the demand for their physical goods after they were found out? Plummeted, went away. What happened to the demand for their concert services? No one wanted to go. Yet, what changed? The exact same physical product. The very same concerts, yet the demand went away. My partner Joe Pine and I will contend it's because what people valued, what they were buying was not the goods or the services, but rather the unique Milli Vanilli experience that was destroyed when they were found out. This pioneer clearly understood experiences way ahead of his time. Beginning in 1928 when he first synchronized sound in Steamboat Willie, we have a very educated audience this evening. Then he went on not only to synchronize sound, but to do 3D animation and Technicolor, the constant layer using of use of technology to enhance the sensory phenomena of the cartoon. And then in 1937, even though critics thought no one would be interested, he extended the duration of time in which people were willing to be immersed in the experience. People thought, oh, you know, they were just remember cartoons were just before the film. You know, quick short thing, and then you're off to the main feature. 
He extended the duration of time in which people would be willing to spend in the experience in, of course, Snow White. And then he went on to, uh, of course, in 1955, open the technological term is the 3D set. We call it Disneyland. And there's a famous story about how Disney then first got the idea for what became Walt Disney World. We don't know if it's folklore. Chances are it probably actually occurred. But he was entering the uh, theme park one evening, as he was fond of doing. It was still, still early. But families were rushing out past him. So he stopped one. And this was before you know, the days of dialogue and one-to-one -one relationships. He just merely stopped one and asked, you know, why are you leaving? And they said, well, we were up on top of one of the rides. We could look out onto the freeway system, see that the traffic was building up. And we figured we better leave now before it gets worse. It was then that Walt Disney recognized that he had lost control of the experience. And where he had purchased an original parcel of land in Anaheim of 160 acres, he then went out and procured 27,500 acres outside of Orlando in order to control his ability to constantly refresh and layer on the appropriate sensory phenomena to captivate and retain his guests. Here's the modern day Disney. Does anyone perchance recognize this gentleman? Well, I hope after this evening you will and you'll remember his name. This is Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the World Wide Web. As a physicist working in Switzerland, he recognized that the value of this decades-old technology, the Internet. Right? When was it that Al Gore invented the Internet? I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> he recognized the value of this very old technology did not lie in the transmission of data and information, but rather the layering on of sensory phenomena, sights and sounds, that allow for the creation of unique online experiences, a reality that's been exploited wonderfully by this company. You know, the technologists, they don't like this company. Right? They're worried about faster, more powerful. But America Online understands the social flows that need to be engineered, not just the financial flows and the informational flows. Right? The, 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 the human interaction from chat rooms and personal profiles and instant messages and buddy lists and the sensory phenomena of colorized fonts, all these sensory Phenomena, which is why America Online shot past Prodigy right, with the full backing of IBM and CompuServe with their millions of install base. How did they do it? Not on the basis of providing a better service. In fact, sometimes the service was worse. Remember? Right? You couldn't get access. But people, those who stayed on, it's because they valued the unique online experience that they're staging for their ever-growing number of customers.